If you've ever tried to raise money, um, it is a difficult thing. It is hard to get people to part with their money. But if you ever wanted to have a fundraiser, I have a few names of people you might consider inviting. Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, uh, David Rockefeller. Um, any of those that are on Forbes 400 list of the richest people in America worth together $1.2 trillion. Now for most of us, that number is almost incomprehensible. Um, let me give you an idea of how much money that is. If you were to spend $1 million every day from the time when Christ walked the earth until now, you still would not spend a trillion dollars. It is an enormous amount of money. And here's the amazing thing. One year ago, Warren Buffett, Bill and Melinda Gates got together and they decided to do exactly that. They began to campaign to get the 400 wealthiest people in America to give half of their wealth to charities. Now, can you imagine what we could do with $600 billion being used for food and clothing and clean water, medicine, technology? If they succeed at this, it will literally change the face of the world. And it is exciting because I'm never going to have that kind of money, but I want to make a difference. I want to see our world a better place. Now, some of that comes simply because when Jesus was asked what is the greatest command, he said, love God and love your neighbor, and took the entire Old Testament and said that's what it's about. This expert in the law, when he answers this question, he says, love God and love your neighbor, and Jesus says yes. Part of it is I just want to obey, but part of it is I have been born of the Spirit of God, and the Holy Spirit lives in me, and there is something driving me to want to be better and make our world better. If you have felt that, if you too get excited about the thought of our world being better, about making a difference, I invite you to come with me into a parable that is very familiar. It has been read, and there are songs made from it. There are laws called the Good Samaritan Laws. I mean, this is a very popular parable because it's in this parable that we learn something about what it means to love our neighbor. If you'd open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 10, it's page 1028 in the Pew Bible. Luke chapter 10. I want to help us see through this parable how we can love our neighbors. Here's the first thing that we see in here. To love our neighbors, we cannot justify our complacency. To love our neighbors, we cannot justify our complacency. I want to start in verse 29, but just as the backgrounds. This expert stood up and he wanted to test Jesus, the untrained teacher. Jesus kind of turns the tables and he says, well, what do you think? The expert answers. But in his answer, he kind of traps himself because Jesus says, you're right, now go and do that. And the expert doesn't want to do that. He suddenly has just admitted, this is what I should be doing. I don't want to do that. And so he turns around and in verse 29, he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Here's a man who says, I am good where I currently am. I am good with my understanding. I am good with my theology. I am good with my actions. I don't want to be challenged. I don't want to change. So let me justify myself. Jesus, who really is my neighbor? And that leads to this parable. If you want to love your neighbor, you cannot justify your complacency. Look into this parable with me. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. It's about 17 miles, and it's a descent of more than 3,000 feet. 
It's also a rather perilous journey because you go through areas where there are caves and rocks and things all along the side. It can be a dangerous route to take. And that's what this man discovers. When he fell into the hands of robbers, he is jumped, he is outnumbered. They stripped him of his clothes. They beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. Here's this poor man making his journey He gets jumped. They tear his clothes off him. They beat him up. They steal his stuff. And they leave him laying on the path, dying. But there is hope. Verse 31, a priest. That should be hope. A priest happened to be going down the same road. When he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. He stood over here. And he just walked by on the other side with the man dying right here. Okay, well, he keeps going. But verse 32, so too a Levite. We've got the pinnacle of religious society here. A Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. Two men. Two men who should have known what to do. Two men who should have loved their neighbors. They passed by on the other side. We're not told the specific reasons why, but we do know this. The parable starts because a man wants to justify himself. And I would bet that's exactly what Jesus is saying the priest and the Levite are doing. Maybe it went something like this. As the priest is walking along and sees the man in the road, perhaps he is thinking to himself, I should stop, but I need to get going because I'm on a schedule and I've got to keep it going. And Now that'd be too callous. Maybe when the priest came by and he saw the man, he thought to himself, well, maybe that guy's dead. And if I get too close to him, I'll become unclean. I can't do that. I'm a priest. And he kept going. Or maybe perhaps he saw the man lying on the road and he thought, well, maybe he's faking. Maybe this is a trap. And if I go over there, I'll get jumped by the robbers. Perhaps. Perhaps. Excuses. Excuses justifications, one after another. Here's what it comes down to. Those two men of God walked by a man in need, no matter what their justification was. They justified themselves to the point that they could leave this man to die. In September, on a normal, crisp morning, I was on 190 heading east. And as I crossed over 75, on the kind of pinnacle of the the overpass, there was a car pulled over, and there was a man who had his hands on the edge of the bridge looking down over 75. And as I passed, I thought to myself, is he going to jump? And I drove a little bit, and I felt something that doesn't happen all that often to me. It happens occasionally. The Lord very strongly prompted me to turn around. So I went, and I turned around, and as I'm driving back, making my way toward this guy, I'm thinking to myself, please let this be a flat tire. And I turned, and as I'm heading up onto 190 again, there's a tow truck right in front of me, thinking, yes, this is a flat tire, I am safe And that tow truck speeds up and just goes right by the guy. So I pull over. I stop maybe 30 feet or so behind his car. I get out of the car. His passenger door is open and there is music blaring. And he's just sitting there like this. And I take a few steps toward him. He turns and looks at me. And his foot goes up onto the bridge. And he started cursing at me like I have not heard ever, telling me to stay the bleep, bleep, bleep away. And I start thinking desperately to myself about all my seminary training and realize I have never been trained to help somebody off a bridge. (laughs) But I start talking to this guy, just doing anything I possibly can. And it took about maybe five minutes It felt like two or three hours, but a cop walks up behind me. And over the next 15 minutes or so, four different cop cars show up. State troopers, negotiators. 
they shut down 75 north and south. We thank you for joining us online. The ministries of Christ Church Plano are made possible by generous contributions from our members and viewers. If you have found this sermon meaningful and would like to make a gift of support, please visit ChristChurchPlano.org give. Thank you.